today we are going to talk about some details of MHC function. In particular, we are going to look at how we go from a pathogen protein in a cell to a peptide from that pathogen protein being presented on the surface of an MHC molecule. Today, we're basically going to look at this in more detail. So we are going to see the actual steps here instead of kind of this vague process. In order to talk about the specific details of that, and we are going to be talking about details of that both today and on Friday, I need to review a few pieces of general cell biology that you saw in Bio 250, but that are so important for parts of this process that I want to make sure we're all on the same page with them. This process involves something known as the biosynthetic secretory pathway. Some people learn this as the secretory pathway. Some people learn this as the biosynthetic secretory pathway. Some people learn this as the endocytic pathway. Those are all words for the same thing. For some reason, after all these years, I have never asked Dr. Dunaway which one he uses in Bio 250. I should do that sometime. However, doesn't matter. They're all the same thing. The basic idea of this pathway is that it is sort of an interconnectedness between different parts of the cell. It is a way that certain molecules, especially proteins, are transported among different parts of the cell. This figure shows you a basic animal cell. You can see that the cytoplasm is shown here, as well as the Golgi, the lysosome, um, endocytic vesicles, secretory vesicles, the nucleus, and the ER. There are proteins that a cell makes that need to be in any of those different locations to do their job. So there are some cells, that, proteins that do their job in the nucleus. Some do their job in the cytosol. Some do their job in the ER. Some do their job in the Golgi. Some do their job secreted from the cell, like, say, interferon, um, et cetera. The cell has to be able to put proteins in these different locations. And we need to have communication between these different locations. And the way that we are moving things between these locations is in, through this pathway, the biosynthetic secretory pathway. One reason why I really like this image is because of the color coding in this image. You will notice that there are a bunch of locations in this image that are depicted sort of in yellow. This includes the outside of the cell, but also the inside of the ER the inside of the Golgi, the inside of the lysosome, and the inside of all of our vesicles. All of the areas on this slide that are in yellow have something in common. And the thing that they have in common is that they are all across a plasma membrane from the cytoplasm. So if a cell wants to put a protein in any of those locations, whether it wants to put a protein in the ER, whether it wants to put a protein in the Golgi, whether it wants to put a protein in the vesicle, or whether it wants to secrete a protein outside of the cell, it somehow has to move that protein across a membrane. So that's what's in common here. So I kind of think of all of those yellow locations as almost interconnected. They're all the across a membrane places. If you remember 
it takes energy to move something like a protein across a membrane. Proteins don't just diffuse across a membrane. So in any situation where the cell wants to have a protein in any of the yellow places here, there had to be some energy and some active process to put the protein there, to get that protein across a membrane. The nucleus, you can see, is a different color because it's special for other reasons. Um, but you can sort of see this idea of these compartments. So all of the compartments that are shown in yellow are interconnected with one another. And the way that we make, that we uh, do this is that we will take proteins from the cytosol. Basically, everybody starts being translated in the cytosol. Um, and we can put proteins into um, different locations. They could stay in the cytosol if they wanted to. They could go to one of these other locations if necessary. Or we could put them into this biosynthetic secretory pathway, which are all of these locations. They're the ones I just showed you on the previous slide. They're the ones that are interconnected by green arrows. Basically, what we can do is we can say, I'm going to take my protein from the cytosol, and I'm going to move it across a membrane. And then all of those across a membrane places are interconnected with one another. So basically, the cell, the cell decides, I want the protein on the cytosol side of membranes or on the other side of membranes. And once we put the protein on the other side of membranes, all of those places are interconnected. You can see that happening in this cell biology textbook figure as well, that we can have proteins that are made uh, by translation with ribosomes in the cytosol, or we can have proteins that are uh, translated by ribosomes that go to the ER as part of the rough ER, and that actually translate that protein across the ER. They just shove the protein across the ER as they're translating. Again, it takes energy to move a protein across a membrane. And this cell is smart in how it does this, because it also takes energy to do translation. And so the cell takes advantage of the translation energy to also shove the protein. <laughs> so it's basically trying to use the same energy for two things, both to do the translation and to shove the protein across a membrane. And then it does not want to move the protein across the membrane again and in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. <laughs> Um, so basically, we either put the cell in the side or put the protein in the cytoplasm and leave it there, or we put it into the biosynthetic secretory pathway, the across the membrane places, and we leave it there, because we don't want to try to like use more energy to take it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across membranes. Um, and so, if we take a protein into this pathway which could eventually lead to putting it in the ER, the Golgi, the endosome, the lysosome, um, or secretion outside of the cell, or sort of anything at the cell exterior, we have to somehow get the protein into the biosynthetic secretory pathway. Um, and this is all done via transport vessels, or transport vesicles. So you can see one compartment here. You could imagine that this compartment is the ER, and we want to move the thing to the Golgi. You could also imagine, so that we could imagine that we're going from ER to Golgi. You could also imagine right now we're going from Golgi to secretory vesicle, or Golgi to endosome, or endosome to lysosome, or you know, one of, between different types of endosome. So we could be going from any one to another of the things up here. I often will say ER to Golgi as my example, but it could be any of these interconnected locations that are being drawn on this next slide. So here you can see two different versions. Um, again, this is from a cell biology textbook of this process. So what you can see is that there are, first, we've got a membrane that has a bilayer. And we can actually see the two different layers of the thespolipids. One of them is blue, and one of them is green. You can see that there's stuff inside the compartment. Those would be the proteins that 
we already use energy to shove across the membrane. They are shown here as pink dots. We can also see that we've got some transmembrane proteins. We had to use some energy to make them be transmembrane proteins too. That was work. And you can see that in this case, the pointy part points towards the inside of the compartment, points towards the cargo, and the circly part points towards the cytoplasm, points away from the cargo. If we want to move any of this stuff to a new compartment, what we will do is we have a vesicle bud off of this original donor compartment, and we'll make this vesicle. So you can see the vesicle formation here. What you will notice is that the phospholipids that were touching the cytoplasm before, which were the blue ones, stay the ones touching the cytoplasm when we make our vessel, our vesicle. Um, the ones that are away from the cytoplasm, the green ones, stay away from the cytoplasm. The cargo stays across a membrane from the cytoplasm. The parts of the proteins that are touching cytoplasm, the round part, stays touching the cytoplasm. The pointy part, which was away from the cytoplasm, stays away from the cytoplasm. And then this uh, vesicle can fuse with our target compartment. Again, our cargo stays inside. We don't have to cross and recross a membrane. It's always stayed away from the cytoplasm. It's always stayed sort of on this inside. You can see that the um, phospholipids stay organized too. The ones that were outside, the blue ones, stay outside. The ones that were inside, the green ones, stay inside. You can also see that the proteins keep their orientation. So the inside part, the pointy part, is inside at this donor compartment. The cytoplasm part, the round part, stayed the cytoplasm part. So this orientation is maintained. Um, you can see the exact same thing um, in detail on the right as well. It's the exact same process, just shown in a slightly different way um, if it was less clear on the left. The reason why this is important is that this means it's really key how we put stuff in the ER in the first place. It's really key, for example, that if we have a way that we want our protein to end up on our donor, comp on our target compartment, that we arrange it in the right way in the ER in the first place. We don't want it to be like upside down, because then it would be still upside down if it was here. If we want something inside, then it's got to be inside the ER if it, we want it to be inside the Golgi here. So the orientation, um, officially known as the topology, really matters. This also becomes really important when we are thinking about the processes that happen with the biosynthetic secretory pathway and the cell membrane. The top is showing you um, the uh, constitutive secretory pathway. What, this, what it means to say that this is the constitutive secretory pathway is that basically if something, once something gets into this pathway, once something gets into the not cytoplasm pathway, it is eventually going to get secreted. Sort of by default, stuff that's in that pathway gets secreted. Unless something happens to it to like keep it from not being, keep it from being secreted, the default is secretion. That's what it means by the constitutive secretory pathway. Um, so here you can see our Golgi. You can see we've got some cargo proteins. You can see we've got some transmembrane proteins. We want to move those cargo and those transmembrane proteins. So we do that in a vesicle. We have the same topology I just showed you on the previous slide. And if we want to actually secrete something outside of a cell, then that vesicle will fuse with the plasma membrane. So it's the same exact fusion process we saw on the previous slide. It's just now we're fusing with the plasma membrane instead of another compartment. But what you will notice is that now these, uh, this cargo that was inside the vesicle gets secreted. So for example, if you really wanted to secrete interferon, you got to get interferon into this into, as cargo in one of these vesicles, which means that somehow you had to get interferon in here which means somehow you had to get interferon into this pathway if you wanted to secrete it. So it actually matters how you like did translation of that protein. Um, 
Also, importantly, if you look at the plasma membrane, this is how we get all of our proteins that are transmembrane proteins, that are plasma membrane proteins. So this, this vesicle could fuse at the membrane, and what you'll see is that the round part that is um, away from the cytoplasm now becomes the extracellular part. And the pointy part that was toward the cytoplasm is the intracellular part. And so if you remember, I told you on the last slide, it would be important when you put a protein in the ER that you didn't put it in upside down. It would be especially important if you wanted it to be a plasma membrane protein. Say you wanted it to talk to another cell. It would be really bad if the receptor part, the part that's supposed to receive something from another cell, was pointing towards the cytoplasm instead of pointing towards the outside world in order to receive the thing. And so it actually matters a lot how proteins are set up in the ER and the orientation they have in the ER because that's going to impact their orientation at the plasma membrane. And so if we want to take MHC and present it and show off peptides at the plasma membrane, we actually are going to care a lot about what happens to that MHC molecule in the ER. We want it to be in the right confirmation in the ER so that when it eventually gets to show something off at the cell membrane, it's in the right confirmation. Um, and you can see kind of this process of secretion or exocytosis here where our cargo gets secreted. In addition, when we do endocytosis, um, this is also true of phagocytosis, um, we are basically doing this process in reverse. And so the um, lipids from the plasma membrane go to the vessel, make the vesicle. The cargo goes inside of the vesicle. Um, if I was worried, if I had a transmembrane protein here, I would have the same kind of topology issues. If this showed two layers of phospholipids, the phospholipids would stay inside versus outside in the same kind of way. So um, when we are actually endocytosing things, they don't just end up in the cytoplasm. They also end up in one of these vesicles. They end up in this pathway. And so anything that we phagocytose or endocytose gets put in this pathway. Um, and so hopefully you can see um, sort of some of the ways that this is going to be really important. And in a lot of ways, um, when immunologists think about cell biology, we often think about sort of dividing the cell into two areas, inside the secretory pathway and outside the secretory pathway. And that's going to be a big distinction that we are going to see here. For the rest of the time today, we are going to talk about the details of MHC class one um, processing and presentation. So here we are specifically going to be looking at how we make the MHC class one protein, at least a little, um, and how we get that protein, um, a peptide, how we get some peptides on that protein, and how we get that to the surface of the cell to show it off. Um, you can see our MHC class one molecule here, both with the heavy chain as well as the beta 2M. Note that this is sort of an incorrect version of the figure because it doesn't show a peptide. This molecule does not fully fold unless there is a peptide in there. So we do not have it correctly folded unless it has a peptide. It looks sort of like this. Remember that MHC class one plus peptide is the antigen that is seen by a CD8 positive T cell. Um, so you can see the T cell receptor is binding to the MHC plus peptide, but the CD8 molecule is also interacting with MHC class one. And MHC class one presentation, this process that we're going to talk about today is done by all nucleated cells. So not erythrocytes, but every other cell of your body does the process that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and as you will see, um, there's also a little bit of a timing of what goes on with that too. And big picture, 
the MHC class one molecule is getting its peptides from the cytoplasm. So I told you that immunologists often like to divide the cell up into cytoplasm or not cytoplasm, or cytoplasm or secretory pathway. For MHC class one, we are getting our peptides from the cytoplasm. That might hint to you where we get them from for MHC class two. <laughs> so today we're going to be seeing this information at the top of the slide in much more detail. Your textbook shows you this whole process for class one and class two in one figure instead of breaking it down. So this is the figure we're talking about, <laughs> but we need to see this figure, this information in slightly more detail. When I learned about uh, MHC class one in graduate school, and when I first uh, started teaching all MHC types, I learned to divide this process of processing and presentation into six steps. So in my head, there's six steps. Some of, sometimes I like to combine them and say five. We'll say six for now, but like some of them you're like, eh, does that really get to be its own step? Um, so I get that if you're like, eh, that seems a little weird. But there are six steps. Use the same six steps for class one and class two. In theory, we could like make a table. The six steps, class one, class two. As you look at some of these six steps, you're gonna be like, that's a really weird step that she tells us today. The reason why, and you're gonna be like, I don't even see why that totally gets to be a step, like why that's important. In some cases, it's because it's important for the other one. So note that in t some of these things and like why I'm, I'm like, this is a separate thing will make sense when you see the other process. Um, but the six steps that we're going to see are, acquisition of antigen, Um, uh, labeling for destruction, so or tagging, tagging is the word, tagging for destruction, proteolysis, delivery, binding, and display. So we're going to see these steps for MHC class one today. Acquisition of an antigen is an easy one in the case of MHC class one. We acquire antigen in the MHC class one process by having the protein be in our cytoplasm. The cell actually doesn't have to do anything in order to acquire the antigen. So if the cell, for example, is infected with a virus, that virus protein is just in the cytoplasm. In some ways, acquisition here is infected. It's just having the protein be in the cytoplasm. The cell does not have to try at all to do acquisition. That's gonna be different for class two where the cell is going to have to actively do something for acquisition. Here, acquisition is just sort of general infection or general having the protein in the cytoplasm. Things start to get more interesting when we get to the next step. So acquisition of antigen, is just that you happen to have that protein in your cytoplasm. You didn't have to do anything active to acquire antigen. So if we want to actually start to destroy that protein to make it into peptides, we first have to sort of say, this is a protein that gets destroyed. 
So we have to tag that protein for destruction. Your cells have two systems that they can use to degrade proteins. Spoiler alert, one of those deg degradation processes is for the cytoplasm. The other is for the secretory pathway. Like you got two trash cans, depending on which location you're in. Another reason why we like to make this distinction. Um, so we are going to be looking at kind of what's really part of the cell's general proteolysis mechanism for things in the cytoplasm. Your cell has to degrade proteins. And the way that your cell degrades proteins is that it puts a little tag on them that says this is to be degraded. You can imagine this is like a little sticky note that you know, tells you, throw this in the trash can. That little sticky note, that little tag, is a small protein called ubiquitin. And so the way that we are going to tag a protein for destruction is that we are going to add ubiquitin to it. Ubiquitin is, a, is itself a small protein. You can see ubiquitin here. Um, officially, it is an 8.5 kilodalton protein. It's 76 amino acids long. Um, and again, you can think of it as just like a little sticky note that we're throwing on other proteins to tell them to get degraded. Um, it has lots of different um, amino acids. Two really important ones are listed here, but it has, a, has in fact, 76 of them. Um, two different lysines are shown here. and what we know in terms of cell biology is that if we have a protein, so here in sort of this green, you see some kind of protein. Perhaps this is our viral protein. Um, we can have a ubiquitin added onto one of the amino acids of that protein. This does require um, ATP. There's a whole process of enzymes that does this in the cell. And if a protein gets four ubiquitins added in a line, then that is the signal to the cell to throw the protein in the trash. Um, so there are actually other things, ubiquitin, other signals ubiquitin can give you if you do it like in a slightly different chemical linkage or not four or something like that. But four in a specific line, they actually have to be specifically linked onto one of those amino acids. <laughs> Uh, that was shown on the previous slide, um, tells you that this protein has to get degraded. Once we have tagged our protein for destruction, we can actually proteolyze it. And to do this, we are going to use the main proteolysis organelle for the cytoplasm, so the trash can for the cytoplasm. So if you were going to name an enzyme that cuts up a protein, what would you name the enzyme? Yes. You'd name it a protease, yes? If you were going to name an organelle, what suffix would you put on the end of the name for the organelle? Yeah. Zome? So if you wanted to make an organelle that did proteolysis, what would you call it? Protease ohm, <laughs> or the proteasome. Um, and so the way that we're going to do degradation here is in this organelle that's called the proteasome. It's just a organelle that is a protease. <laughs> So anything that has that ubiquit that string of four ubiquitins added to it, any protein like that, um, gets it gets taken to this organelle called the proteasome, where it is degraded into peptides.
you can see a structure of the proteasome here. The proteasome has a cap on either end, which is shown in blue. Um, it's kind of important. You don't want random important things to go into the trash. You want a cap on it so other stuff doesn't go in by accident. Um, and then you can actually see that there are four rings um, that are in the middle that make up this core. Um, two alphas and two betas, and each of them, if I'm remembering correctly, I think there's seven proteins per ring. Uh, yeah, you can't, you can see caps and rings here, but you can't see the specific numbers. Doesn't really matter. And so what will happen is that the cap will actually recognize the ubiquitin. The cap says, ah, this tag, this means we need to throw this away. And the cap also takes off the ubiquitin. It says, we're going to save this tag and use it again. We don't need to destroy the sticky note. We just need to destroy the sticky note, the thing the sticky note was attached to. So we take it off so we can recycle it. So here you can see the recycled ubiquitin. This, the proteasome basically unfolds the protein. So we kind of string out the protein <laughs> into a line. You can see it getting unfolded here. And then cleaves that uh, protein into little peptides. And so you can also see this happening in this figure on the right where we're going to recognize the ubiquitin with the cap and get rid of that ubiquitin and kind of unfold that protein, shove it into the core, which is really kind of shaped like a big barrel. Honestly, I often think about it as being like a big barrel. Shove it into the barrel, we're gonna get cleavage of that protein into small peptides. Um, the one reason why it's sort of important for me to mention some of the details of the structure of the proteasome is that the proteasome's structure can change in different cells at different times. So what I'm showing you here, both of these figures, as well as the figures from the, uh, some of the previous figures are from cell biology textbooks. This is just general cell bio. However, immune cells, um, or cell, uh, different types of cells can sometimes change their proteasome into one that is particularly good for MHC class one type responses. If, and so the, the proteasome usually looks like the proteasome on the left. It makes some peptides. They're these like pink ones and stuff. If the cell um, is exposed to interferon, the cell actually makes some different subunits for the proteasome and changes up the proteasome. And so the cell doesn't make the standard garden variety proteasome anymore. Now that there's interferon, the cell sort of is like, oh, I, I should be trying to make a response. I'm going to make a proteasome that's extra good for immune responses. And so this changes the proteasome because it has slightly different subunits to make the immunoproteasome. And the immunoproteasome makes, uh, uh, sort of changes the way that this um, proteasome cuts. So you can see some peptides are basically the same and are getting made either way, but the immunoproteasome will make a slightly different subset of peptides. The most important thing about the peptides that are made by the immunoproteasome is that peptides made by the immunoproteasome tend to be between eight and 10 amino acids in length. With the normal proteasome, they might range from like, I'm, I'm making up my top number. The bottom number is correct. The top number I don't remember. They can range from two to 40. So like some of them are gonna be eight to 10 which is, if you remember from last time, the perfect size for class one. But some of them are gonna to be too small or too big. When we're in a situation where we're making an immune response, we're gonna to try to make all of our peptides the right size for class one, so that we can make sure we're making a super good class one response. So that's the proteolysis step. Um, so now, basically at this point, we got some peptides. <laughs> 
Well, our goal is now to get those peptides onto MHC class 1. So we need to think about two things. What is MHC class 1 doing during this time? And how are we going to get these two things together um, so that they can start to bind? So this sort of addresses a little bit of both of those things. So first of all, this is addressing what is MHC cl class 1 doing right now? MHC class 1 eventually is going to be on the surface of a cell displaying our peptides. As a result, MHC class 1 has to be made in the ER. So MHC class 1 is biosynthesized uh, as a transmembrane protein in the ER. And its binding cleft is in the ER lumen. It's in the inside of the ER away from the cytoplasm. Because that's where it has to be to eventually get on the surface of the cell. Remember that I told you that class 1 does not fold uh, entirely correctly until we have class 1 and beta 2M and a peptide. And we don't have a peptide yet. Um, and so our MHC class 1 molecule is actually held in the ER with a whole bunch of different chaperone proteins to help it stay folded approximately correctly until it gets those peptides. So right now, our MHC class 1 and beta 2M are hanging out in the ER along with chaperones. The most, I'm not going to name drop all the chaperones. The only one I'm going to mention specifically is one called Tapicin. So Tapicin and other chaperones are holding MHC class 1 here. So you can see MHC class 1 is hanging out, ready for the peptides. And the peptides are being made by the, either the proteasome or the immunoproteasome, depending on the situation. So got our first three steps ready. But now we have to think about step four. This, in a, a real, this realistically is the big problem of MHC class 1 presentation. So in, in both class 1 and class 2 presentation, there's kind of a, a big place where you're like, ooh, that's a problem in this scheme. And the one that's like big flashy lights, like what are we going to do, is delivery in MHC class 1. And so I've edited this figure from your textbook a little bit. Um, so if you look at this figure and the way I have edited this figure from your textbook, what is the delivery problem for MHC class 1? Why is delivery like the important step for class 1 if you look at this image? Yeah, Sydney. Yeah, the peptides are in the cytoplasm. The MHC is in the ER, and the place where the peptide needs to go is in the middle of the ER. So somehow we have to get the peptides across a membrane. We've got to get the peptides from the cytoplasm into the secretory pathway if we're going to make this whole business work. And so for a while, people didn't, couldn't figure out how to do this or how the cell did this. Um, they eventually found that the ER has a special transporter that specifically transports peptides into the ER. This transporter is known as TAP, or the transporter for antigen processing. Um, this is actually structurally very similar to certain transporters you learn about uh, in general cell biology. Uh, so this is a molecule. This uh, protein, it actually has two protein chains, TAP1 and TAP2. It uses ATP in order to move those peptides across uh, the ER membrane. And so TAP performs delivery of peptides to MHC class 1. So 
So now you can kind of see this process here. Um, this is the actual version of your textbook that's not edited by me. Um, we have this molecule TAP, which is really important to actually basically shoot the peptides into the ER so that they can go to the right location. Um, we're using energy to do this. Um, and we can also think a little bit about binding. Uh, so there's also one nice trick here with the binding. Tapicin, which is one of the chaperones I told you about before, Tapicin interacts both with the MHG class 1 molecule and with the TAP transporter. So Tapicin basically holds empty MHC next to the TAP processor. So it's basically like the peptides are being shot in, and there's this open cleft MHC sitting right there, ready to catch any peptide that will bind. Um, and so the binding is made kind of automatic based on the way that Tapicin holds uh, MHC class 1 next to the TAP antigen processor. Um, peptides are only going to bind if they have the proper uh, anchor residues and are the right size to bind to a particular MHC class 1 um, type. And so only a peptide with the right anchor residues is going to actually bind here. Um, some of the peptides that are coming in are going to be too big. Um, and there are also some proteases that can trim peptides um, in the ER in order to make them fit perfectly. So sometimes if there's a peptide that doesn't quite fit right, it can get trimmed by another protease in the ER. So there is a little bit of processing after that point, um, but uh, not a ton. The last step of the MHG class 1 presentation pathway is pretty straightforward. Um, if you remember, and so you, this is the figure from your textbook kind of showing the whole thing, where we see an antigen in the cytoplasm going through the proteasome, getting degraded and moved across TAP, coming on to class 1. Once you have something in the secretory pathway, as I told you before, by default, it goes to the cell membrane. That's the constitutive part of this pathway. So unless you have something hold, that holds it back, it just automatically goes to the membrane. So this just doesn't get held back. It automatically goes to the membrane. So it's, in fact, a constitutive process to put this, to display this on the surface. So once, basically, once tapicin stops holding it, once it's all folded correctly and has a, a peptide, tapicin stops holding it. And once tapicin stops holding it, it automatically goes through the rest of the process and just constitutively goes to the surface. Um, and so you can see that, that that process here, where we have uh, some antigen in the cytosol, gets presented on class 1, that will activate a um, CD8 positive T cell, because the CD8 uh, and the TCR recognize class 1 um, and MHC plus peptide. Um, and the CD8 positive T cells are the cells that actually are the killer T cells that are cytotoxic. And so those T cells will now kill the cell that had a thing in the cytoplasm. So there was something bad in this cell's cytoplasm. In fact, most frequently, the bad thing you would have in your cytoplasm is a virus that we can't really get rid of otherwise. This virus wants to make this cell into a virus factory. And so we kill that cell so that it cannot be a virus factory and so that we don't have this virus around anymore. So, Specifically, class 1 is going to turn on a CD8 positive T cell or a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. And you can see this whole thing in overview here. Um, so this is the uh, version from your textbook of this processing uh, pathway. This is a table that talks through all of these specific um, details. So 
Um, this is kind of the big picture overview piece of MHC plus one. Um, I have some really important information about MHC plus one that I need to tell you about that honestly like is un an underpinning of a lot of immunology. You also seem a little tired. So I'm gonna have, we're gonna do something as a quick interlude before I get back into this very important information because it is like such important information. Um, one of the times that I TA'd immunology when I was an undergraduate, or when I was in graduate school, um, one of the professors I TA'd for um, was a guy named Shiv Pillai. And one of the things that was really great about Shiv, that is really great about Shiv, is that Shiv wrote immunology poetry. And some days, mid-lecture, he would start reciting immunology poetry. That was hilarious. And just in the middle, like, he would just stop his lecture, recite one of his poems he wrote, and then keep going. And we, have, we managed to record mo many of them, because he then performed them like at every event we had for graduate school. So we actually recorded them, and they're all on YouTube. Um, and so I want to show you the first of the, the many that you will see this semester quickly now as our like fun interlude before we go back into this. And you will see why I'm showing it to you now. Um, this was not the first one he ever wrote. This is the second one. Um, I cannot, I will not be looking at it because he does this little dance during it and the dance freaks me out. So notice I'm not looking at the dance because I just <coughs> cannot. I also apologize for the fact that this will be in your head for the rest of the day. Wait, why did you do that? Oh, is it playing in the background and like wanting to, there we go. All right, um, I hope you can hear it. That's the one question I have is whether or not you're gonna be able to hear it well. I don't know how to make it better if you can't, other than me turning up the volume as much as I can. All right, let's hope. I thought we needed that today. Um, I hope we can now also all say that we will never forget TAP and the function of TAP. <laughs> Jamie, you missed like the funnest thing. It's okay. You'll have we'll have to have you watch the YouTube video later. Okay. So. Um, now I kind of want to talk about a couple of other, like I said, pretty massive issues in thinking about um, MHC class one presentation and how this actually kind of works in reality. Um, so if you think about 
an entire microbe, first of all. Think about how many proteins are in the entire microbe. The answer is a bunch, right? And think about how many ways you could take those proteins and cut them up into different peptides that are between 8 and 10 amino acids long. Again, that's like a ton, right? So this kind of showed you the idea of class 1 and sort of the typical A peptide gets onto class 1. But what you should realize is that it kind of looks a little bit more like this, in that we have some protein from the microbe. And in fact, we have more than one protein. So there's not just one chicken. There's also like a fish and stuff. Um, and it gets cut into different parts. One part might be the drumstick that goes through tap across the ER membrane gets on class 1 and gets presented to a CTL. However, remember, all of your nucleated cells don't have one MHC class 1 on their surface. MHC class 1 is codominantly expressed. So your MH all of your nucleated cells have six MHC class 1s on their surface. And so in reality, things look a little bit like this. For some reason, the person who drew this had to draw offensive faces on the people. I love the concept of this, and I do not love the offensive faces. So I got rid of them. Um, <laughs> so what you can see is that our protein is going to be degraded into multiple different peptides. It's not like you only get one peptide out of a protein. You get multiple different peptides out of a protein all sorts of different parts of it. So you can see all of the different parts of our protein here as peptides. Each of those may bind to a different MHC class 1 molecule because each of those MHC class 1 molecules has a different peptide binding cleft um, with a different set of anchor residues and a different pre preference for different peptides. And so our T cells are going to actually be seeing in general, many peptides from that same microbe um, and kind of see this whole array as is shown here. Uh, one thing that we, uh, that we know about these responses is that all of the peptides are not equal in terms of their ability to turn on T cells. So just like this T cell police guy might really want the chicken foot the most. <laughs> Individual T cells are going to uh, respond different. Like they're only going to respond to one of these different options. They're not going to respond to all six. So your, each T cell is going to respond to just one of them. And some T cells are going to respond better than others. And so this is why different people with different MHC types are going to make better or worse responses. But even in sort of the case of um, a particular response, we will often see that some epitopes are immunodominant over others. And so this antigen has multiple possible epitopes, a brown one, a blue one, and a purple one. They can all get um, made. Um, in fact, this shows only one getting presented. They probably all will get presented. Um, and, but one of them will stimulate T cells the best. Um, we don't actually fully understand why that one stimulates T cells the best. One reason is that they usually aren't all made at the same frequency. One just gets one peptide gets made more often than the others, and so that's part of the reason because it would get on the surface more because there's more of it. But there are also other reasons on the T cell side, um, and so this is showing you an example that if we look at um, HIV, these are a whole bunch of different peptides that can all bind to the same uh, HLA type, HLA-A2. So if a cell has HIV, these are all peptides that could bind from HIV that could bind to HLA-A2. And if we actually look at how well the T cells respond, for some reason, this one, gives us the best T cell response. 
and we don't know why. Part of it, it has to do with how much of the protein is available, but that's not the only piece. So oftentimes, we're going to talk about sort of an epitope like it's the only one, <laughs> but know that it's not. It's, we're usually just talking about the dominant epitope. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of. And here you can see um, kind of some of the things that are involved in the dominance hierarchy. So out of all of the proteins from a particular virus, some of them are going to be made well as peptides. Some of them are going to get transported well by TAP. Some of them might just not really get ever made ever. Might just be a weird, like the, they might be resistant to proteolysis at that spot. Or TAP might just really hate that peptide. Some of them might not bind to class one. Some of them might, and then there's sort of additional things at the T cell side that actually make some of them better than others. So what I want you to realize is that yes, in fact, realistically, we're with any one uh, protein, we're making many epitopes. And with any, and in fact, we're looking at one protein out of many proteins from any particular microbe. But we also have the other super, super, super important thing. <laughs> I feel like I'm like neglecting things <laughs> by, by giving this so few slides, because it's just so important. So I've talked through the steps of MHC class one presentation. And some of the figures that I used, especially at the beginning of this, were from general cell biology um, slides. So we can kind of imagine pretty easily a situation where we have this viral protein in the cytoplasm that we got from infection going through this whole process. But are viral proteins the only proteins that are in the cytoplasm? So I see lots of head shakes of no. What other proteins are in the cytoplasm? Sydney. All of the cell proteins, all of the self proteins, every, all the parts of the cell are also there. And so we can also think a little bit about kind of self non self here. Okay? From what you've seen so far, are there any things that, have, that are listed here that are specific just to virus proteins and not to self proteins? So the answer is no. Um, ubiquitin gets added to proteins in the cell when they need to be degraded. Whenever you have a protein in the cytoplasm that needs to be up, it gets ubiquitin added. That might be because the protein is misfolded or has a problem. But there's also another reason why that protein is going to eventually get ubiquitin added. So this is an iPhone 13. In the past, I've had other versions of an iPhone. I think the first iPhone I had was an iPhone was a four, maybe. And then I had a five. Then I had, I think, a six, etc. Why do you think I went from an iPhone four to an iPhone five? Yeah, Jamie. Okay, it wasn't working as well over time. Yeah, Justin. Pardon? I improvement or just, I was sort of, that one was kind of old and I was tired of it and kind of wanted a new one. There's just like a general half-life of iPhones <laughs> before you're like, I'm ready for a new one. That's the way it is in your cell with proteins. There's a certain turnover rate where proteins just get degraded. Part of it is because there's sort of this assumption that the protein may have gotten damaged. And so, you know, the idea is that proteins are just degraded at, after a certain amount of time in case of, say, oxidative damage or something like that. But every protein in your cell is turned over with some kind of half-life and just replaced with a new one, like a new iPhone 13, which maybe you need, maybe you don't. <laughs> so all of your cells, or all of your proteins in your cells, are getting ubiquitin added to them at some rate. Every protein in your cell is going into the, in the cytoplasm, is going into the proteasome and getting degraded and made into peptides at some rate. TAP doesn't know where that peptide came from. It doesn't know, oh, this is an eight amino acid product of ectin. 
versus, oh, this is an eight amino acid part of SARS-CoV-2. It's just a string of eight amino acids. TAC is shooting them all, or TAP is shooting them all into the ER. Any of them could bind, any of them could be displayed. And so in fact, all of your cells, all of your nucleated cells are presenting self-peptides at all times. So self-peptides are being presented by MHC class one by all of your nucleated cells at all times. So you are basically always showing T cells, hey, this is what I have inside me, am I okay? And so this is why I don't like kind of thinking about it like a trophy. Because we're presenting self-peptides 24-7. Right now, you are presenting self-peptides on every nucleated cell to sort of show that your cell is healthy and to show that your cell is OK. Um, and again, this is happening in every cell of your body except for erythrocytes right now, where we are actually presenting on MHC class 1, um, all of our self-peptides. We're going to have differences in what the T cell does and how the T cell deals with the self-peptide, but that's on the T cell side. And so we're going to deal with that when we talk about T cell responses. This is actually so important that if a cell ever stops presenting on class 1, if a cell actually loses class 1 presentation, we have another whole arm of the immune system that kills it, because there must be something wrong with that cell. So is, in fact, a sign of cell health for the cell to be presenting self-peptides 24-7. Um, so this process that I'm showing you here happens to self-peptides as well as non-self-peptides. It's the T cell later that's going to care about the difference. But what you can also imagine is if something goes wrong with the T cell, we're a little bit at risk because we're presenting so many self-peptides all the time. Um, in tomorrow in lab, we're going to be doing cDNA synthesis and qPCR. Remember that there is an hour downtime, um, so have something to do, which could be your um, problem set, because um, remember the problem set is due on Friday. And on Friday, we're going to talk about this process with MHC class 2.